Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the George S. and Dolores Dory Eccles Foundation and the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, Steve Bannon takes aim at powerful members of the GOP. Why is he targeting Orrin Hatch? Could this impact the 2018 midterm elections? And what does this say about the divisions within the Republican Party? Utah sees a surge in citizen-driven ballot initiatives. Which ones are garnering the most attention? And with so many in play, can all of them succeed, or will some fail? With less than a month to go until the election, candidates make their final pitch to voters. Who is leading, and what historical barriers will be broken? Good evening, and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Morgan lyon Associate Director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Michelle Quist Mumford, Editorial Writer with the Salt Lake Tribune, Damon Kahn, Professor of Political Science at Utah State University, and Ben Winslow, Political Reporter with Fox 13 News. It was a busy week in politics. We don't seem to have any other kind these days. But one piece of news that really captured the attention of Utahns was Steve Bannon coming out and targeting a number of high profile members of the Republican Party, including our own Senator Hatch. So Ben, maybe you can make sense of this. Some people were confused by this. Hatch has been supportive of the president's policies. Unlike some of his Republican colleagues, he hasn't really been very outspoken against President Trump. So does this, ex does this surprise you? What explains this? I, how can you explain it other than maybe sometimes people just want to watch the world burn? Um, it, it, upending political norms seems to be uh, Steve Bannon's uh, just modus operandi. So why, why not? I, I guess you could ask, you know, he's, he's out of the White House and he's getting very active in recruiting candidates to um, upend these political systems. And Hatch, who is uh, seen as a loyalist to President Trump, seems to be an easy target, a likely target. I don't know about easy, maybe, uh, in Utah, but he seems to be, you know, he's clearly been targeted. Well, and with identifying some of those other candidates, Michelle, we saw also that he talked about Boyd Matheson possibly right. taking the Senate. Is this an endorsement that Boyd Matheson would want? I, I wouldn't think so. Or any candidate I, I don't in Utah think any would want. candidate. You know, Utah um, did vote for Trump, but, but by the smallest margin from all of the states that, that Trump won. And people associate Bannon with Trump. And I don't think that anybody would be looking for that type of endorsement. What do you make of all of this, Damon? Well, we, uh, when Steve Bannon was appointed uh, to serve in the Trump White House, uh, we had a poll out in the field, uh, and we found that 16% of Utahns approved of Bannon's appointment. Now, Orrin Hatch has had some struggles in the poll lately, but he's still more popular than Steve Bannon is in Utah. If you're looking for someone to back you up in an election in Utah, Steve Bannon's not your guy. So would it be the kiss of death for a candidate? I mean, would he have any luck courting anybody here? Oh, I think he could court somebody here. There are certainly people he could get uh, who would who would run. But the other thing is you have to look at the, the opposition campaign that goes on, that you are the hand-picked candidate by Steve Bannon. That could spell trouble. Well, let's take this a little broader right now, because it wasn't just Orrin Hatch. He said he was going after every... Senate Republican who's up for election except Ted Cruz. So is this part of watching the world burn? What is, you know, what is his aim here? It, it's, it's just they're looking at, he, he's doing what he's doing. And we're going to have to see how this plays out. But obviously, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is interesting that you're targeting some people who seem very safe. And uh, but there is he's channeling that frustration, that frustration that led to President Trump getting elected. And this could just be furthering that. I think Steve Bannon's trying to stage a hostile takeover of the Republican Party in the United States, where we have a, a two party system for structural reasons. Uh, you can't really start your own party and have a tremendous amount of success with that. So instead, the Bannon strategy is to burn down the old Republican Party and try to rebuild something new in the mold of what you would like to see happen. Uh, and there's going to be some challenges uh, to making that succeed in Utah, uh, where the vision for the 
the future of the Republican Party is very different from Bannon's, but there are some places in this country where Bannon's message is very appealing and where he may have a decent shot at knocking off some traditional establishment Republican senators. Well, and I agree because he's not targeting senators on the same ideological, you know, plane. He, he has Senator Flake, who's very, very conservative, and Senator Heller, who's a little more moderate. He just wants to, to redo everything. He wants people in there that are loyal to him. And, you know, he's not going after Cruz because, probably, because the people who fund him fund Cruz or like Cruz. And, and that kind of explains the, the pick of Boyd Matheson. He's a Lee guy, and, you know, Lee and Cruz were, were um, always, you know, together. And so I, I, don't think it, I don't think it's a good thing for anybody to have that, that endorsement here in Utah. Well, nationally speaking, what is a Republican candidate to do if perhaps you don't want that Bannon endorsement? Um, Trump has very tenuous, we'll call it, approval ratings in a lot of part of the, uh, the country. And then a lot of people don't like Mitch McConnell either. So what, what can these Republicans, sitting, either sitting Republican or maybe challengers, do in the 2018 election? The long-term strategy for success in any election, in, in my estimation, is building a coalition, not just going in as the Bannon guy, not just going in as the establishment guy uh, or whoever's guy. Right now we have a really divided Republican Party, uh, and we have a really divided Democratic Party as well. Uh, and an effective candidate has to go back to basics of building a coalition. Uh, if you have Steve Bannon's support, uh, he may not be my guy, uh, but if you've got his support, that's not going to be enough. You're also going to have to bring in someone else who can, can add, uh, add another set of voters to that coalition. Uh, and the successful candidate of the future in these kinds of internally divided partisan times is going to be a candidate who can find ways to appeal to the different factions within their party uh, to be able to win primaries and then ultimately to be able to win in a general election. Moving from elections to maybe what's going on currently in Congress. So, Damon, as you said, we've so much of the conversation over the last year has been about the divisions within the Democratic Party. But especially within this last month, we're seeing major divisions within the Republican Party. What can explain the timing of this? Why is this happening now and what's going on within the party? Maybe, Michelle, you could speak to this. I think it's been happening all you know, since the election of, of President Trump, it's it's a hard for a lot of Republicans to have him as the, the standard bearer. Um, he he doesn't necessarily represent the values that many Republicans hold dear, and um, but it, it's just becoming you know it it's it's it, it, it we can't keep it in anymore. You know the the Republicans that are not Senator Corker is you know he's retiring. He feels a little freer and and he has reason now to 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 stand out stand up and say. You know, this is not who who we represent. Ben, what about the response from the White House? We see some of them are standing up. Um, how has the White House responded, and is that strategically a sound way to go? If you want to know how the White House is responding, <laughs> all you have to do is check Twitter. Um, the White House, uh, the president does his own thing. He pushes back, and that's pretty apparent from what we're seeing is, is he is not afraid to engage his opponents, ideological or otherwise. If they're not going the way that he wants them to go, he will push. Leg with the legislation, Damon, that we're seeing, we have tax overhaul, we have heard that they want to have a big transportation bill, and some of our uh, federal delegation have been very vocal on these. But that 52-seat majority in the Senate, we're finding out, is actually pretty narrow. So how does this strategy of feuding with his own party, does that affect the chances of this legislation? It, it presents a lot of challenges because ultimately members want to be led and incentivized. Uh, the, the successful presidents who have been very effective at working with Congress have done so by encouraging uh, with positive incentives rather than doing so uh, by threat of intense punishment. I guess if you go back to Johnson giving some of the senators the treatment, uh, you have, uh, the have way that, back that machine style now. if we go way back. Uh, but in recent years, presidents have been most successful. Uh, look at what uh, 
what Barack Obama did uh, in working on the Affordable Care Act. He went to the marginal senators and went one by one and said, what's it going to take? Uh, and, and they worked out ways to, to provide deals that would make things attractive rather than taking to Twitter and lambasting the people who weren't going to work with him to achieve what he was wanting to do. I think uh, uh, to be successful, uh, Donald Trump needs to rethink his agenda and go more to the backroom deals uh, and go more for finding out what the members want and what they need. I think it's weird that I'm suddenly promoting backroom <laughs> deals. Uh, but this is politics, right? And, and uh, you need to have ways to try to help people reach their objectives rather than just going after them in the press if you want to be able to be persuasive. The problem is that's not how President Trump won election. You know, he he didn't horse trade. He didn't build coalitions. He put it out there and the silent majority, you know, who who thought, yeah, I want to hear real talk and and this is he's going to get something done. You know, they they voted for him and and so his his way is his way or the highway. You know, he doesn't know how to build coalitions or I mean, you'd think he knows how to do backroom deals, but he apparently doesn't think that he needs to. He right. may be good at real talk, but what we're seeing is Congress isn't in board with his real action. Yeah. Okay, great. We're seeing some really interesting ways of governing at the federal level, and we're maybe seeing some interesting ways of governing here at the local level. We have five currently signature gathering processes to try to put ballot initiatives on the 2018 ballot. And one of the things that is so interesting with this is that these are not, you know, in the weeds minor issues. These are major policy proposals, education funding, Medicaid reform, um, redistricting, the list goes on. So Michelle, what explains this? Why are we having these very important, this could have long-term and sweeping changes on the state. Why is this going the initiative? You know, I think we have Politics now is a lot of money, and money's available, and money's out there to, to up for grabs. I think it's it's easier to put your own idea out there through an initiative than than it is, you know, if, if you've been trying to get it done for a couple of years in the legislature, and the legislature isn't catching on. Uh, for instance, marijuana. You know, we they've had the legislature now has had it two years. They still haven't passed it, and it's it's the citizens. You know, there's there's a high percentage of citizens who want to see. Um, this you know go forward and I think it's easy for and well the the initiative process isn't easy but it's easy to start it's easy to try you know you, you get a lot of money and that will get the signatures that you need and, and to get it on the ballot I think I don't think we can say yet that the populace is dissatisfied with the legislature until they pass if they pass that's what it means but getting them on the ballot is I think special interest groups are getting involved or is it just a sense of frustration from voters, though, that the legislature's continued inaction is not su satisfying people? Because there's clearly an audience for this. The, there is, and they will sink or swim based upon how many signatures they get, whether they qualify for the ballot. But is it just really more of an issue of the legislature has continually not addressed this issue, so now we're going to go forward with this. There may be some special interest money behind it, right. but is that what's creating it? But they're addressing the issue by not addressing it, you know? So I think we could say that if we see them pass. I don't think we can say that yet. I see a little bit, uh, something a little bit different here as well, not to, to say what you guys are, are, are thinking is not right, but uh, I think a lot of people have a tendency to believe that everybody else believes what they believe and that somehow the legislature is stopping this from happening. Uh, but when these initiatives come out, I think we'll get a better sense of where everybody's really at as they start to take the time to, to listen to what the campaigns around the initiatives say, uh, get a little bit more educated, and I think we'll see public opinion crystallize a little more clearly. Right now, people can move a lot in one direction or the other because they just don't know a lot about these issues mm -hmm. yet. And as people learn more, uh, we'll get a better sense of what the odds are of them really passing. I think the sheer number of how many we have will doom some that might have passed otherwise. Uh, five is, is hard for a, you know, a citizen to sit down and say, okay, you know, what, what, what do I think on, on each one of these? You know, if there were one or two, it, they could have focused more on those. But, you know, you have five, it's like, well, which one was this one? And I, I don't remember, I'll just, you know, just no to all of them. Well, um, Utahns like to say we aren't, even though we're a very Republican state, we don't vote straight ballot. I vote for a Democrat or Democrats will say, I voted for a Republican. 
M Michelle, with what you were saying, is there something to that as well? We don't want to maybe stro vote straight yes. Right. A re maybe a responsible person says no. Right. So if that's the case, what do you? Which of these ballot initiatives do you think gets hurt? Um, I think it hurts. I think it hurts the our schools now ballot initiative that may have passed otherwise for the, the taxes for the school school funding. Um, I, I think that I think five is just too many, and and that the top two seem to be marijuana. And perhaps count my vote. And I, you know, uh, f last year or a few years ago, there were three constitutional amendments on the ballot. Two of them were completely reasonable, and uh, none of them passed because it was just easier to say no. Damon, which one do you think bears the brunt? Oh boy, that's a tough one. So I'm going to uh, dodge a little bit on this and say whoever does the least advertising. Okay. Uh, and the reason why, there's a lot of really good uh, political science research on this. And uh, if people don't know very much about a ballot, initi a ballot initiative or they don't know exactly what it's going to do, then they just vote no. And so whoever makes the most noise, in my opinion, has the best chance. Uh, whichever of these initiatives ends up being the least interesting, the least well-funded, the least talked about, I think is dead, where it might have had a chance if it was, as, as Michelle pointed out, just maybe one of two initiatives that were on the ballot. Uh, but if people don't know uh, what they're doing, don't have a good sense of it, they just vote no and move on. All right. What about you, Ben? I think that... Our schools now is definitely on the bubble, but I think it's not necessarily for the reasons that uh, you all have articulated. I think it's in danger because of the, um, the shy voter. Everybody says that they want to support education. Everybody says that they want more money for schools. But when you get somebody in the privacy of the, the ballot and you ask them, but do you really want to pay for a tax hike? I think that that's where you may have some people start going, oh, I don't want to pay more in taxes. I already pay enough in taxes, and, and you see that. Um, other campaigns, uh, I think it also just depends on how much they can mobilize and get those signatures gathered, get those verified in time to qualify, because then the real work begins. And there's a lot of them that have filed very recently, and that window that you have to get, and you have to get a large part of the state that window that you have to get is 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 getting shorter, smaller, and smaller, and smaller, and smaller, and so, you know, some of them time is not on their side. Right, and as you have all touched on, educating the electorate on these issues can be really difficult, especially when some of these are also up for debate at the federal mm -hmm. level. With the Medicaid expansion just yesterday, we had an executive order from the president mm -hmm. regarding health care. Um, we have, it seems, nearly daily updates, another attempt to repeal and replace, or they're defunding some element of Obamacare. Um, and with the the Better Boundaries Initiative. We have, okay. yeah, we have a gerrymandering case that the U.S. Supreme Court is determining now. So, Michelle, with that redistricting case, maybe especially, how do they message this? How do they navigate those waters? Yeah, it's it's hard. I, I wouldn't know how to. I mean, the, the problem with the redistricting ballot initiative is that you're still only creating a, a, a commission that is, um, the legislature doesn't have to accept what the commission does. You know, it, it's it's just a counselor form, and and so to message it, you know, you can you can argue that that our our districts are gerrymandered, but the case in front of the Supreme Court, Wisconsin, uh, the their in their system, the Republicans received less than half of the vote, statewide mm -hmm. vote, but ended up with more than sixty percent of the House and Senate. You know, that's different than here. Here is you know you. Republicans get more than half the vote, and they have more than half the Senate and, and House. So it's a hard argument. Yeah. But the organizers have told me that the basic counter argument to that is it's the kiss of death for the legislature to not go along with this. Why do you not want a more open and fair boundary drawing process? You know, why do you hate this competitive election process? Sort of going to the legislature and saying that. Why do you oppose this? It, it's that giving them this kind of uh, no-win solution here, paddling them into doing that. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of their counter argument. What they're banking on is that if voters approve this, then the legislature is forced to go along with this. Right. Otherwise, it's bad for them come election time. It's just hard to publicize the arguments with the counter arguments and the explanation of what the commission's going to do anyway and why the power is really in the legislative, you know, for in the Constitution. And it's, it's, it's complex. 
What about the opposition to some of these? We've talked about how you get it on the ballot, how you get all, how you garner your support. Um, but what about the forces that are trying to fight against these, including perhaps the legislature? I remember um, after the first effort for Count My Vote, which resolved with a compromise with the legislature with SB, SB 54, um, some analysis saying this might be the end of the initiative process in Utah if the legislature will try to legislate the issue away. So are we seeing either groups trying to fight against these? Are we trying to see, are we seeing the legislature perhaps come in on some of these issues and try to find legislative solutions? I think it's both. Yeah. Yeah, I, the legislature does not like the initiative process and I understand why. There's no accountability to a voter if um, something is, is enacted through an initiative, you know, and it goes wrong or it, it doesn't work or it needs to be switched a little bit. H how do we go back to every voter? You know, the, the legislature doesn't have the accountability that they would have had otherwise. Um, and so they, they do a lot to make it difficult. You have to get 26 of 29 counties and, you know, it's, it, the signature barrier is quite high. Um, but I think there are also Americans for Prosperity are here in Utah. Uh, the Utah-based group of AFP is, is, you know, against the, or for, they're against the school tax. Yeah. <laughs> the marijuana one got me, got me switched there. <laughs> um, you know, and, and they're going to be campaigning hard against that. So I think it's both. Okay, so before we move on, I'm going to make you all play odds makers again. And Damon, maybe you already answered this, but which one do you think has the best bet to win? I would say medical marijuana. Okay, Damon. I'm going to go with the, the uh, count my vote. Oh, uh, I thought you were going to say whoever spends it. the most money. <laughs> <laughs> I think count my vote will spend the most money. Okay, there you go. I think medical marijuana is polling really well, and the X factor there is how vocal the LDS Church is in opposition. Right now, they've kind of said they have concerns about it, but they haven't come out with a full-throated opposition at this point. Um, that could uh, certainly impact things, but right now it's polling to win. Okay, thank you. So we've talked a lot about 2018, but we do have an election this year. We have the municipal and then the special election to fill Jason Chavitz's seat. And it's debate season for the congressional district. So we saw some interesting things. We've had um, a debate earlier in the week and a debate tonight with those candidates. Um, one of the things that was interesting with that earlier debate in the week got a little contentious, uh, but one thing that was very interesting to me was when the Republican candidate, John Curtis, was talking about how he supports President Trump's policies, sort of big picture, and he tries to ignore um, the, the distractions, he called it. So, Michelle, will you flesh this out for us? What is he trying to do there? I think he's trying to make sure that, uh, you know, to, to to show that he's in for tax reform and he's in for you know health care reform and and the big Republican ideas that are always Republican he's saying those are those are what Trump is trying to go after he wants to drain the swamp and and theoretically he agrees but uh, using distractions he he doesn't you know he doesn't want to associate himself with kind of the the bipolar things that President Trump does every day and you know and they are distractions it's this, his Twitter feed is is blowing up all the time because of this. But and you can't ignore the distraction either. Well, <laughs> well, and sometimes they come up, even if it isn't his Twitter feed this week with Harvey Weinstein, all of those Access Hollywood tapes have been shown over and over again this week as well. Right. The, the third district is the most conservative in Utah, and I think John Curtis is a moderate candidate who's trying to make sure that he uh, is, you know, is attractive to the the more conservative voters in that district than, than he would be otherwise. Damon, this, does this give us a sense for what midterm elections might look like for Republican candidates, sort of trying to support the president but also hedging a bit? I, I think that's exactly uh, what's going on. I think every Republican who's running for Congress in the 2018 midterms uh, uh, is going to be watching how John Curtis handles this and how this plays with his constituents because uh, it gives them a model to look to. And I think Curtis is being very smart about the way he's handling this because, uh, as Michelle pointed out earlier, the Trump administration is trying to take on some core Republican issues that uh, where there's broad agreement within the party about the kinds of policies they ought to pursue. And, and Curtis needs to show that he's supportive of those kinds of issues rather than taking a wholesale blanket, I am against everything that Donald Trump ever says he might ever want to do. Uh, but at the same time, Trump is not popular in Utah. Uh, he won the state, uh, but he didn't have a majority of votes in the state. Uh, he won the third district, uh, but uh, John Curtis has to win over voters, uh, not just who 
tepidly supported Trump, but uh, he needs to get those voters solidly behind him, get them out to the polls. Uh, John Curtis doesn't have the benefit of being running against Hillary Clinton. Uh, which is probably the best asset Trump had on his side in Utah. Uh, John Curtis is running against Jim Bennett, and he's running against a, a solid uh, Democrat in Kathy Allen, and so uh, he needs to be uh, on target uh, and on message in order to be able to succeed, and I think he's done a pretty good job of trying to thread the needle there. For our final topic tonight, uh Provo will have their first female mayor in the city's history, and they found out when they filed that a woman had never even filed to run for mayor in Provo before. And another Utah county, City Woodland Hills, will also have their first uh, woman mayor elected in her own right. Michelle, you were with us last year when we were talking about gender and politics, so why has this taken so long to ha happen in Provo? I think it's crazy that this is the first time, that this is the first time they'll, it will have a, a female mayor. Um, I, I just the the, the social uh, culture that that we have is is that women don't you know do that first they do family first and and you know the the two candidates have said recently that you know our families are done and now we have this um, I, I'm okay with that but even women who have families have you know a right if they're interested to go and and be involved and and run for office and I think we're better when they do. Ben, with your reporting, you're, you're out and you really see these things firsthand. Do you think we're seeing more women get engaged with politics or more women running for office? I think there's still some hesitation. I think it's not for lack of people trying. You think about uh, wonderful events like Real Women Run, uh, which is doing one again this weekend in northern Utah, mm -hmm. trying to encourage women to get involved. But there still seems to be that hesitation, uh, like Michelle put it, uh, this family first thing. that. Uh, women somehow don't feel like their place is in the legislative branch or the executive branch and uh, that's unfortunate because diverse voices obviously lead to diverse perspectives lead to diverse policies okay thank you so much for this wonderful discussion that's it for tonight's show our conversation continues online at KUED.org/hinkley report thank you for joining us good night